The west bank of the Elbe, April 1945. At Schoenig, south of Magdeburg, engineers have built a temporary bridge and named it after America's new president, Harry S. Truman. They've also called it the Gateway to Berlin, but that is not the direction in which the GIs will be marching. The other bank of the river is where the area under Soviet control begins. Stalin's troops were already engaged in bloody street-by-street -street fighting for Hitler's capital. So Hollywood director George Stevens and his team of photographers and cameramen had to forget all thoughts of filming in Berlin. Following the celebrations at Torgau, Stevens had received new instructions. He was to head south, where the 99th Infantry Division was on the verge of liberating Dachau concentration camp. It was to be his worst experience of the war. Dachau was where I learned about life. Since D-Day, George Stevens had accompanied American troops halfway across Europe. He had witnessed the liberation of Paris and the defeat of the Wehrmacht. In his equipment, Stevens had 16 mm color material, which lent an oppressive authenticity to the scenes he filmed. As an experienced Hollywood director, Stevens knew the magical effect of pictures all too well. On April the 26th, 1945, American tanks were advancing east of Nuremberg. Over the last few days, the GIs had once again been involved in heavy fighting with fanatical Nazis. It was still not clear whether, despite what he had announced, Hitler really had left Berlin, and now, together with his closest followers, was ensconced in what he called his Alpine fortress. At this time, camera teams with Special Film Project 186 were in action in Nuremberg. They too were using 16mm color film. Their brief was to document the successful story of the US Air Force in the fight against Nazi Germany. Hitler had ordered the city of the Nuremberg rallies to be defended to the last man but on April the 20th, Nuremberg finally fell. Its inhabitants looked to the future, to the new era under American occupation. But their traumatic experiences remained unforgotten. To make things as difficult as possible for the Americans, the Germans had blown all the bridges but within a few days, engineers had built temporary bridges to guarantee supplies to the troops. The fighting was fierce, even in the suburbs of Nuremberg. But in the city center, order had totally collapsed. On April the 12th, 1945, journalist Franz Nadler wrote in his diary Nuremberg is dead. There is no light and no electricity. There is no gas and virtually no water. There is untold misery, unspeakable hardship. So many people are sick or dying. But there are only few doctors. There are no coffins for the dead, no hearses to collect them. An automatic camera filmed Nuremberg from the air. Allied bombing raids had caused massive destruction. Around 90% of the city lay in ruins. More than 8,000 people had been killed. The many days of urban warfare had made the situation in the city center even worse. Historic buildings that had been spared over the last few months had now collapsed. 
April the 26th, 1945. In the shadow of the ancient city wall, a boy in short trousers stands out. Like many other youngsters his age, 12-year-old Friedrich Erhardt was searching the rubble for anything of use. He and four friends then posed for the US Air Force cameraman. Throughout the city, the victors' rules were announced by microphone. One of the first measures was to impose a curfew from 6 p.m. to 7 a.m. During this time, no one was allowed to set foot outside their home without permission. The military police were ordered to shoot anyone who had no permit or tried to hide or escape. The US military journal Stars and Stripes stated quite plainly, The Americans did not come to Germany to pat the hats of child murderers and to nurse SS criminals. In line with a policy of non-fraternization, GIs were forbidden to have any contact with Germans. Nuremberg's infrastructure had collapsed completely the daily fight for survival centered on the search for food and water. The Red Cross had set up a water point by the city wall. People formed an orderly line as they waited with their buckets. Ten days before, there had been chaos here with wanton looting. The whole area, Fritz Nadler wrote in his diary, had become one vast and shoddy store. Those with nothing more than a minor wound could count themselves lucky. Only a few days ago, this Air Force soldier too had been a bitter enemy of the Americans. The camera team with Special Film Project 186 filmed the sites of the former Imperial City. Because of the danger from bombing raids, when war began, the 14th century beautiful fountain was bricked in. On April the 20th, 1945, the Americans had given the Gauleiter, the district leader, an ultimatum. But the fanatical Nazi had no intention of capitulating on Hitler's 56th birthday. No surrender was his curt response. As a result, the slaughter in the streets of Nuremberg continued until the evening. In the end, the district leader was found dead during the five days of urban warfare in Nuremberg, around 400 soldiers and members of the national militia were killed. 371 civilians also lost their lives. This is how an eyewitness described the desperation during the siege of Nuremberg. In bunkers and cellars, people sat pressed together pale, sick, passive figures. Totally exhausted, they just stared at the stretchers where our wounded lay. Now people were looking to the future, along the lines of let the past be. But the victors would not be so quick to forget the role that Nuremberg had once played for the Nazis. On April the 21st, 1945, the US Air Force camera team also filmed at the old Nazi rally site in Nuremberg. Here, where Adolf Hitler had once given his inflammatory speeches, GIs enjoyed the entertainment provided by jazz musicians and other artists. It wouldn't be long before many Germans would also be gripped by this feeling of being alive. Swing instead of military music, 
the ultimate defeat of the Nazis' murderous ideology. On April the 27th, 1945, a camera team with Special Film Project 186 accompanied a reconnaissance unit on a trip through Franconia. The soldiers were looking for a suitable site for a new airfield for the US Air Force. Eventually, they reached a former Luftwaffe airfield that had been destroyed. To make the pictures more impressive, the men had set fire to this wreck once again. There was also little left of the hangars. Here too, it was thought that fresh flames would make the scene look more dramatic. It is not known whether the reconnaissance unit finally chose this location as the site for a new US airfield. Even villages in Franconia still reveal traces of the final hostilities. Here, a tank barrier has been cleared away. White flags as a sign of capitulation. Here, a GI is interrogating Germans who have surrendered. With hardly any Wehrmacht troops still fit for action, old men and children were supposed to defend their villages. A motley crew deployed as a last resort. Even the chief of staff of a notorious SS Army Corps, which in the first three weeks of April had still put up fierce resistance in Franconia, admitted later that because of American military superiority and our total own exhaustion, we were scarcely in a position to offer serious resistance. Here, too, German prisoners of war are held in provisional camps with no roof over their heads. The cameraman's notes do not tell us why these men in civilian clothing were also interned. They had probably drawn suspicion to themselves or belonged to the Nazi party. The Americans were still afraid of partisan activity by units in civilian dress. The werewolves, as they were known, who could mount attacks in the occupied areas. Prisoners in uniform had to be treated in line with the Hague Convention. One of its stipulations was that prisoners of war be allowed to write to their families. But in the weeks and months that lay ahead, it would be impossible for the US military authorities to deliver letters in a totally devastated Germany. So for a long time, wives, parents and siblings had no idea whether their husbands, fathers, sons or brothers had survived the war. In late April, a camera team with a special film project 186 reached the town of Plauen. Plauen had been a national socialist stronghold even at an early stage. This is where the precursor of the Hitler Youth movement was founded 
the organization which systematically steeped Germany's young generation in hatred and fanatical militarism. An entire generation was exposed to the lunatic ideology of the Nazis, at home, at school, and in youth organizations. Years of brainwashing that could not be expunged from one day to the next. In late February 1945, Plauen was one of the main targets for British and American bombers. When the US Air Force team filmed in Plauen, a good 80% of the town center lay in ruins. More than 2,300 people had been killed in the bombing raids. The survivors were slowly beginning to rebuild their town. Anything that could still be useful was salvaged from the rubble. The cameraman took particular care to film the ruins of this building. All that has remained intact is a relief of the Iron Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, who in the late 19th century had unified. At this point in time, unification seemed lost forever. The cameraman also took the first ever color pictures of the rubble women, as they were known women engaged by the American occupying forces to do clearance work. All women between the ages of 15 and 50 had to report for duty. They were paid for their efforts in the form of better food rations. In the midst of all this desolation, a picture was taken which symbolized hopes of a brighter future. It shows an American soldier in Plauen giving a small boy some chocolate. In spring 1945, Germany was virtually defenseless against British and American bombing raids. Even the anti-aircraft batteries, which were usually located outside the towns, had little impact. In late April, a US Air Force cameraman filmed a flak emplacement somewhere in a part of Germany that was already occupied. As early as 1943, boys born between 1926 and 1928 were manning flak batteries. In 1945, all fit men aged 16 and older had to fight at the front. So in the final stages of the war, even 15-year-old children were deployed as Air Force helpers, as they were known. April the 30th, 1945. Here, American M4 Sherman tanks have taken position somewhere in Bavaria and are shelling a village. These pictures, it seems, were staged for the cameraman, because by this time, US forces were encountering hardly any resistance. In all likelihood, the buildings on fire only served as practice targets. On April the 30th, 1945, Grand Admiral Karl Dönitz learnt that in his last will and testament, Adolf Hitler had appointed him President of the Reich and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. What Dönitz did not know was that Hitler and his newly wedded wife, Eva Braun, had already committed suicide in the bunker beneath the Reich Chancellery. Dönitz sent Hitler a telegram a declaration of loyalty which documents the total blindness of the Nazi leadership. My Führer, my loyalty to you will be unconditional. I shall thus continue to make every attempt to relieve you in Berlin. But should fate still force me to head the Reich as your personally appointed successor, I shall see this war through, just as the unique heroic struggle of the German people demands. The American tanks could only progress slowly in difficult terrain. Their goal was the so-called Alpine Fortress, 
General Eisenhower was still afraid that the enemy's political and military leadership had absconded to Upper Bavaria and was entrenched in the mountains. If the Germans were allowed to establish this fortress, they would possibly force us into a prolonged guerrilla war. On April 24, 1945, six days before Hitler's suicide, US General Omar Bradley had given a gloomy situation report. He told a parliamentary delegation from Washington, The war against Germany may last another year. Time and again, the GIs had to clear tank barriers built by villagers. The terrain was not suitable for the use of heavy weapons. Narrow mountain roads and bridges made progress difficult. Here, the numerical superiority of the Americans played hardly any role. While the Red Army was conquering Berlin in bloody urban warfare, American elite troops were making their way along peaceful mountain roads and through idyllic Alpine villages in search of German bunkers and fortifications. A flight of a Dachau concentration camp near Munich. Set up in 1933, it was the first concentration camp on German soil. Here, for 12 long years, inmates were tormented, tortured and murdered. On April the 30th, 1945, George Stevens and his team entered the camp. They found a train full of corpses, victims of the death marches, as they were known. Concentration camp inmates who, on their odysseys through Germany, had starved or frozen to death or been shot. In a report written later, Stevens noted, it was like wandering through Dante's vision of hell. US troops had reached the concentration camp north of Munich the previous day and liberated over 30,000 prisoners. On April the 30th, 1945, one of the survivors, Edgar Kupfer Kobowitz, wrote in his diary, American soldiers come into the camp to look at us. A group of them were taken to a block. In the washroom lay the corpses of 50 inmates who had died of starvation or exhaustion. When one of the officers saw the bodies, it brought tears to his eyes. It is strange to think that a man who had been in a battle and seen so many corpses, an officer in the middle of a war, should weep at the sight of our dead. But I know that. I know what our dead look like. The sight is so shocking that even the tears of a warrior are understandable. Some of the GIs reacted with uncontrollable rage and shot around 50 of the guards, but most of the culprits were arrested. George Stevens' team filmed the SS tormentors, who now claimed that they were nothing more than insignificant underlings who had only been obeying orders. Just how afraid the inmates were is documented by an entry in the diary of Dutch resistance fighter Nico Rost. A day before the camp was liberated, Rost wrote, 6.30 a.m. The SS have raised a white flag. Are the Americans so close? Will the SS, who have remained, hand over the camp without a fight and kill us first? I don't even trust the SS's white flag. Why do they still threaten us with their machine guns? No, the SS will always be the SS until they are destroyed.
Guards, who at the last moment had disguised themselves as inmates, were identified by real camp inmates. Members of the SS could also be identified by the tattoos on their arms, which indicated their blood group. This man really was an inmate. The number tattooed on his lower arm proves it. George Stevens and his team spent a few days in Dachau to document conditions in the camp as accurately as possible. One major problem in Dachau was the risk of an epidemic breaking out. Former inmates helped with the delousing. To feed the survivors, the Americans brought bread to Dachau from their army supplies. But even after liberation, many inmates still died as a result of their suffering. American journalist Martha Gellhorn was in Dachau when, on May the 8th, 1945, a Polish doctor told her that Germany had surrendered unconditionally. I was in Dachau when the German armies surrendered unconditionally to the Allies. We sat in that room, in that accursed cemetery prison, and no one had anything more to say. Still, Dachau seemed to me the most suitable place in Europe to hear the news of victory. For surely this war was made to abolish Dachau and all the other places like Dachau and everything that Dachau stood for and to abolish it forever. A flight over Munich, the capital of the Nazi movement. Here, the Second World War ended on April the 30th, 1945, the day Adolf Hitler committed suicide in Berlin. US troops occupying the Bavarian capital met with little resistance. Munich, too, had suffered heavily from British and American bombing raids. A team with Special Film Project 186 used an automatic camera to gain an impression of the extent of the damage. One Air Force cameraman in Munich was interested not so much in living conditions in the city as in its political past. Before the war, Hitler had had grandiose parades staged on the Königsplatz. Whenever he was in Munich, he stayed at the Führerbau, the Führer's building. Party bigwigs had tried to protect it with camouflage netting. The Prince Karl Palais, until 1933, the official residence of Bavarian presidents was deserted. Under their code name, Pheasant Hunt, patriotic forces had called for resistance against the Nazis. But only a few of Munich citizens reacted. Even with the Americans at the gates of Munich, Hitler's governor of Bavaria also refused to lend his support to the movement, which was brutally crushed. In the end, Munich was taken without a fight. The House of Art II was still covered with camouflage netting. It was in the Palace of Justice in 1944 that the members of the White Rose were sentenced to death. Led by Hans Scholl and his sister Sophie, the group had distributed flyers calling on people to renounce the Nazi regime. The Brown House, the Nazi headquarters in Munich, had been totally destroyed in a bombing raid. It was at the Feldherrenhalle the Field Marshal's Hall in 1923 that Hitler's attempted putsch failed. On May the 2nd, 1945, the Germans learned that their Führer was dead. He had allegedly fallen in battle. Journalist Ruth Andreas Friedrich wrote in her diary, Hitler is dead, and we all behave as if it did not concern us. <laughs> 
Events had surged over him. The Third Reich has vanished, like some spectre. With the swastikas on his Nazi flags, Herr Hitler, too, has landed on the rubbish dump. Go to hell, Führer and Reich Chancellor. Tempi passati. You don't interest us anymore. In negotiations with the Americans, Munich's cardinal, Michael Faulhaber, tried to improve living conditions for the city's inhabitants. Looting was still a daily occurrence, but the occupying forces quickly put an end to the chaos. Here too, people were glad that the war was finally over. All that was left of the Hofbräu house was the facade. It was in this world-famous tavern that Adolf Hitler's career as an inflammatory orator began. GIs on guard at the Bürger Bräukeller. In November 1923, Hitler proclaimed the National Socialist Revolution here. Now the historic beer hall was being used by the US Army as a canteen. While the cameraman with Special Film Project 186 was filming in Munich, George Stevens also arrived in the city. The Red Cross was using the Maximilianeum as a military hospital. In 1949, Bavaria's democratically elected state parliament would move in here. The Hollywood director and his team recharged their batteries after the strain and stress of the last few weeks. The indescribable pictures of the horror of Dachau were pursuing George Stevens, and he was glad for a change. While people were still dying in the concentration camp north of Munich, in the city itself, its inhabitants were already sunbathing again by the River Isar. Stevens and his team also visited the holy sites of the Nazi regime, like the Brown House, which now lay in ruins. And the Königsplatz, with the Temple of Honor, which housed the ostentatious sarcophagi of those killed in the attempted putsch of 1923. Stevens did not know that Georg Elsa, who had once tried to kill Hitler with a bomb in the Bürgerbräu Keller, was murdered shortly before Dachau was liberated. From Munich, US Air Force camera teams drove south and west along Hitler's autobahns. Near Augsburg, a cameraman discovered strange-looking aircraft on the edge of the autobahn. They had obviously been parked there to avoid enemy bombing raids. Now the wrecks were just scrap metal. But as wonder weapons, these ME-262s had been expected to change the course of the war. These planes don't actually look like conventional fighter aircraft. They're more like futuristic designs from science fiction films. The ME-262 was the first jet fighter. At the time, it was also the world's fastest aircraft. Here, the jet engines have apparently been dismantled. American special units probably took them somewhere safe for transportation to the United States. Near Augsburg, too, there was a closely guarded production site where slave workers had to build the ME-262. A camera team with Special Film Project 186 has reached Berchtesgaden. On May the 4th, 1945, the town surrendered to the Americans without a fight. In a flyer addressed to its citizens, District Chief Executive Theodor Jakob had expressed the hope that our women and children and our beloved homeland will thus be spared grave misfortune. Nevertheless, the first few days of American occupation were marked by assaults and even rapes. But the US military administration finally got such excesses under control. Berchter's garden wasn't just any town in the Third Reich. 
Located close by was the Obersalzberg, Hitler's mountain retreat, which was clouded in secrecy. Now the complex was just an expanse of rubble. Because in the early morning of April the 25th, 1945, the restricted zone for the Führer got an unwelcome visit. British bombers devastated the area to prevent it serving the dictator and his entourage as a final retreat. By now it was clear to the Americans that they had been fooled by a propaganda lie, as General Bradley later openly admitted. The Alpine fortress took on such an exaggerated form that I wonder how we could be so stupid as to believe it. At the center of the complex was Hitler's Berghof residence with its huge panorama window. Now it was the attraction for all the GIs. Shortly before the Americans arrived, the good citizens of Berchtesgaden looted not only Hitler's retreat, but also the underground bunkers, which were chock full of foodstuffs. In 1939, a road had been blasted out of the mountainside, especially for the Führer, so that the Kehlstein House could be built on the summit. Because snow was still lying here, the camera team couldn't get right to the top. So the cameraman made do with taking these shots of the locals. It wasn't only Hitler who enjoyed a domicile on the Obersalzberg. Other important Nazis also had their own villas here. Near Berchtesgaden, American troops discovered an abandoned freight train fully laden with art treasures. The valuable sculptures, paintings and tapestries had all belonged to Hermann Göring. Hitler, second in command, had greedily snatched up works of art from all over Europe and kept them at his estate near Berlin. With the Red Army advancing, Marshal of the Reich, Göring, had everything crated up and transported south. But he could no longer take delivery of his art collection because on April the 23rd, 1945, Hitler had removed Göring from all his offices and had him placed under arrest. The stolen works of art were seized by the Americans and later returned to their rightful owners. On May the 5th, 1945, a camera team with Special Film Project 186 reached Linz. By now, the Wehrmacht had capitulated here too. The cameraman filmed German soldiers being held prisoner at the historic Trinity, or Plague, column. In Linz, too, the spectre of Nazism had vanished as if nothing had ever happened. But German and Austrian soldiers, who for six years had enthusiastically followed Hitler on his criminal path, were now bearing the consequences. Linz held a special significance for Adolf Hitler. It was here that the dictator had gone to school, and here that he had discovered the music of Richard Wagner. And it was in Linz that his beloved mother had been laid to rest. In his bunker beneath the Reich Chancellery, nearly every evening Hitler would pay a visit to a model of his plans to transform Linz. After achieving final victory, together with Eva Braun and his dog, he intended to retire to the city where he had grown up. But in May 1945, that was the last thing the people of Linz wanted to hear. All that mattered now was their relationship with their new masters. The city's last defenders were marched off to American prisoner of war camps. On May the 5th, 1945, the commander-in-chief of the German armed forces, 
Admiral Karl Dönitz decided, first of all, to end hostilities against the British. A secret command document reads, If we lay down our arms in northwest Germany, Denmark and Holland, it is because the fight against the Western powers has been rendered meaningless. But the battle in the East must continue to save as many Germans as possible from Bolshevism and enslavement. Through proud manly behavior and dignity, each soldier has contributed to the German nation's shield of honor, remaining pure and sacrosanct. Even now, after a struggle that has lasted six heroic and honorable years and is without parallel in world history. Naturally, no mention was made of the countless crimes which soldiers of the Wehrmacht had committed or been complicit in. This cynical attitude, tantamount to historical amnesia, clearly corresponded to the attitude of most German soldiers. On May the 5th, a German soldier who was supposed to fight against the Red Army near Görlitz wrote in his diary, In the West, there is already a ceasefire. The end is near. The most bizarre rumors are doing the rounds. They say that the Americans will release our prisoners and rearm them in order to drive the Bolsheviks out of Germany because our homeland must be liberated. Some of us still hope for a new offensive, but most of the troops want it to end. However, everyone is prepared to fight on immediately if it means joining forces with the Americans against the Russians then it will not matter how much longer the war lasts. Somewhere outside Linz, the German prisoners of war encounter units of Vlasov's army. Since autumn 1944, around 100,000 members of the Russian Liberation Army had fought on the side of the Nazis against the Red Army, under the command of General Andrei Vlasov. The fate that awaited them was far grimmer than that facing their German comrades. In accordance with the Allied agreements made in Yalta, the Russians were to be handed over to the Soviet Union. Those who were not executed were banished to Siberia for at least six years. On the evening of May the 5th, 1945, author Erich Kessner noted in his diary, Depression is turning into irritability. Everyone is making someone else responsible. Everyone is blaming everyone else. And everyone is excluding just one person from this blame, themselves. Why are people irritable? Because they are surprised? But how can they be surprised? Did they actually believe the deception? Did they really confuse the outrageous rhetoric with facts? No one can be that stupid. You can only pretend to be. Now they are pretending to be surprised. In other words, they are playing dumb again. They would rather be thought of as a complete idiot than as a scoundrel. <laughs> 